Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1009th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Sasha Yano and Ksenia M. Sobleva. And now I'll introduce Sasha and Ksenia. Sasha Yano is a Lenape Hoking NYC based performance artist and actor. Their solo practice is rooted in theater, queer performance, and radical Jewish tradition, using humor and physicality to explore themes of gender, aging, loss, and diaspora. Yano's work has been presented by venues including MoMA PS1, Dance Space Project, Joe's Pub, and many, many others. And our host today, Dr. Ksenia M. Sobaliva, is a New York-based art historian specializing in queer art and culture. She holds a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU with a dissertation on art, AIDS, and lesbian identity in the United States. So Beliva is currently working on a book project titled Friendship as a Way of Art, Queer Identity and Visual Citation, and co-editing with Svetlana Kito, the first major publication on the lesbian gallery Trial Bloon. We are very lucky to have Ksenia as a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ksenia to get us started. Thank you so much, Chloe, and thanks to everyone, the whole Brooklyn Rail team, for making this possible. It's such a pleasure to be here, as always. Uh, and congrats to Sasha um, on Uncle, which just premiered at the kitchen yesterday evening, and I was very happy uh, to be there. And I wanted to start actually by reading a little piece that Svetlana Kito wrote uh, about your work. And Svetlana was originally going to join us. Um, but I think this will be a good introduction into uh, the performance and also this way she's with us a little bit. Uncle is an experimental reimagining of the poem Spiel, the comic dramatization of the Book of Esther, which is the central text and narrative of the Jewish holiday poem. As Uncle Moretikai, a shape-shifting diasporic well were werewolf ancestor who also goes by friend of Dorothy, Elder Tree, and Old Growth, Yano performs an incantation that combines biblical Hebrew rituals, priestess spells, Yiddish theater, queer and drag performance, night nightclub antics, anti-Zionist traditions, and the phases of the moon. Toggling the thin line between Jewish humor and grief, Uncle reframes the old story, calling on us to re-inherit our various cultural lineages and identities, finding them both new and as old as trees. So that was by Svetlana Kito. Um, Sasha, there was so much there yesterday. We had uh, the werewolf and the figure of the uncle and um, references to Purim and references to the AIDS crisis and then trees. Um, I would love uh, I would love to start by asking you first of all how did you arrive at this project which you've been working on for a few years now and then could you map out for me how all these things are are connected particularly the references to you know Purim anti-Zionism AIDS crisis how do they all come together in this figure of the uncle because ultimately the performance is titled uncle so the uncle is as I understand it really at the core the mm. uncle is what holds it all together. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. Well, yeah, first off, thank you to the Brooklyn Rail for having us. Um, I'm a longtime big fan, so it's an honor to be here. And so great to get to talk to you, Katinia. Um, yeah, so this piece is, um, I imagine it sort of in the as the third in a trio of works that I've created that um, start with family figures as a like a starting point to talk about broader social contexts and questions. Um, and they're specifically my family members, but they hopefully have some sort of also um, more universal aspects. Um, and so the first piece was in 2015. It was about my father. Um, that it was at the new museum and it was a very quick, very quick, like invitation and turnaround. Um, and uh, in it, it was sort of the first and I, and I found that to be a very like transformational experience with my actual father um, and long story, but that led me to um, the second piece in the trilogy, which was about my maternal grandmother and the Jewish Borscht Belt and 
that moment in time of Ashkenazi assimilation in the US. Um, and through that, that piece, um, I, you know, I did not think that this was going to be, a, I didn't set out to make this be a body of work, but um, it felt like there, like a third one was just sort of coming to me <laughs> after that piece. And it started as, you know, both of those other pieces were very, very like scripted, long form, particularly like, so Dad Band was a very short uh, development. Sherry Dre, the second piece was like a couple of years of development with like oral histories and in the Catskills and, you know, various things. And this uncle really started because I wanted to be able to, I mean, in a very practical sense, I wanted to be able to show up to invitations just to do like a 10 minute thing um, in group, you know, sort of like performance evenings. And so I was like, I just want to like be able to just have more of a, um, I hate the word character, but just sort of like more of a, like whatever this next piece was, I knew it, I, I had this feeling it was about my uncle, but I wanted it to be definitely more improvisational and exploratory. So I ended up um, starting to just show up to different invitations as this sort of uncle figure, um, which sort of- Maybe can pull up a slide actually so that people can see. Sorry, go ahead, Sasha. Yeah, so people can, um, so I showed up sort of as this like uncle figure, which maybe is in a different slide, like, yeah, some of those early ones in different contexts. Um, and at some point I started to realize, you know, I, I had also started to interview my actual uncle and the process just had started of like, I felt that there was more to share about his story and it had a lot of different connotation and that like, you know, if these portraits are sort of like, psychological portraits of these different figures, psychological social portraits. Um, I felt like, oh, this is another one that really is a full evening of like talking about like the constellation of ideas involved here. And so I started to develop it into um, a longer piece. Um, let me just pause there. What was the question? <laughs> yeah, so. Well, well, I, I, I can respond to that also because I, um, something that, connects us actually is um you know i have i have this ongoing project um that i first delivered at as a as a performative lecture at artist space last year which is about my great grandmother um mm -hmm. not jewish but uh my family's tatar and mm -hmm. i think that she was a lesbian and uh -huh. uh, and so it is it's basically my projections of queer desire onto her life but mm -hmm. i had, i had a very we had a very strange relationship. She was very distant. So I never really got to talk to her about her life. She wouldn't answer any questions. And so as I understand it from the performance, of course, I don't know how much of that is ac actually yeah. autobiographical, but you had the opportunity to actually talk to your uncle about his queerness. Well, it's interesting that you asked that. So, you know, my the two first pieces, Dad Band and Sherry Dre, that about my father and my grandmother, you know, I grew up with my father, but he was, we had a very distant kind of, I didn't know him very well. Um, and my grandmother, I hardly really knew at all because of just mental illness or just like not being treated with the right medications. Um, but I felt like I, this, so those pieces were sort of connecting. My dad is still alive. My grandmother is not. Um, my uncle, I have much more of a relationship with, um, but there were, but he's very, I mean, he's closeted. He's not out, he's out to me. Okay. Um, and there was a part of, part of what was going on here is that I would try to, to ask him things, both about his experiences as a doctor through the first decade of HIV AIDS, um, as a gay person and as a doctor and someone who was not out and also um, his, I just wanted to understand more about like his love life and his life and like hear his stories, but he was very, he's very, very private. Um, and so um, there were our other uncles. So he's my, so just to back up, like mm -hmm. this piece really feels like it's about queer, like, so the gay uncle as a potential like liberatory family figure, you know, like sort of like alternate form of family and care and lineage. Um, 
you know, with p potential of that. Um, and uh, both blood family, because I do have this gay, actual confirmed gay uncle, um, but also all the queer uncles that have been in my life and who kind of have, you know, raised me in some way. Um, and then just thinking about other, so queer lineages, also performance lineages that I have been birthed from um, both in terms of queer performance practices and also Jewish cultural traditions. Um, and so I'm thinking about the uncle. So it's, it started with the life of my actual uncle, but it really is a riff on that in terms of talking about these other lineages and connection. Um, but when I was, you know, but then there's my actual uncle's story. So his story in here is definitely woven with many other uncle's stories that I spoke with, particularly one other uncle in my life, elder who, Philip Yanowin, um, who was one of the founders of Art Matters, who a foundation that I worked for for a long time. Many of, I don't know how to, much to go into this now, but like many, so there were other uncles in my life who actually shared much more details of their story. And so it mixed with my uncle's kind of um, story. But when we spoke with each other, I said to him like, you know, do you feel comfortable with me you know, sharing some of your life and story in this mm -hmm. piece. And he was, you know, he was like, well, you know, there's something to respecting people's privacy, which is actually a line that just yeah. made it. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, so can, can you just say really explicitly, like, what does that mean? Do you not want people to know that you're gay? And he had some, cons he was like, well, you know, he's like, he didn't want to not have me do it. He, he, he gave his blessing, but he was very concerned um, about, he, he still has concerns about his safety, the safety of his patients. Um, I think he's still in a place of like, yeah, fear around it. And, um, that, that to me didn't, I, I don't experience that, you know, like he did. And I think he's still carrying it with him. Anyway, he's given he's his blessing. Doctor. He's still a practicing doctor. So he's literally, he's a lung doctor, a pulmonologist who's been practicing medicine through now literally like four different plagues, all of which are still ongoing, like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, COVID. Um, holy, I mean, just, he's just been, he's seen a lot of plagues. And so that was also, I had started this piece before COVID, mm -hmm. um, but what like spoke, just happened to, you know, be working on it and spoke with him through all of COVID. And it was just, you know, drawing different associations between the plagues was a kind of a wild experience. Um, but he's coming tomorrow night. I, I was going to ask. Okay. Yeah, he's he's coming tomorrow night. We'll see what he, um, yeah. Um, I wish I could, I wish I could meet him. Um, yeah, it's in a way it's easier to project onto a ghost. I, you mm. know, my great grandmother passed away and I only started this project like a year ago. Yeah, um, I don't know what like with what it's like with you, but I feel like as much as these pieces and this piece is about my uncle and these uncles in my life, including these uncles that are like from the 1800s, like I, I'm really looking for both like queer and anti-Zionist Jewish like uncles that are piecing together lineage. But it's really not, a, I'm not like making, I'm not like, um, what's the word? Like impersonating them or trying to accurately portray them. I'm trying to align with some sort of essence. Yeah. Them in a, in a way that is really about me, like in the searching, not really about trying to be them, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, I mean, it's the beauty of queer ancestry. And, and it also makes me think of, um, you know the movie Poor Things that everybody's raving. I mean, I loved it. Um, but yeah. there's there's this one you saw it. No, I haven't seen it. Oh man. Um. Okay. Well, whatever. Might be spoiler alert. But at some no, actually, it's not. Um. Uh, at some point, there's this one line where um. Emma Stone is told, "You are both your mother and your baby. Mm -hmm. You're both mother and the baby." And I was like, "Oh yeah, that is so queer. There is something so profoundly queer about that." Um, okay, well, you should see that movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so tell me where the werewolf comes in, because at the yeah. beginning of the performance, I 
thought we were gonna play the werewolf game which was very popular i don't know if it's popular in this country but when i was in high school in the netherlands that's what everybody was playing was what is it oh it's not a thing here oh or not a thing in my life i don't know what is it it's, it's a card game it's a card game and um one person is a werewolf and then there's villagers and it's like you play it with your eyes closed and at the beginning like there's like a classic speech where somebody says so we are surrounded we are in a village da, 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 and there is one werewolf on, among us oh and wow kind of along the lines of what you say at the beginning of the performance i was like oh it's the game we're gonna whoa play game. whoa no i mean wow no, I would love to offline talk to you more about that. Okay. <laughs> but um, no, okay, so well, um, I guess where this came in, it came in pretty, so as I, you know, as I was like riffing on my uncle's life, I started to um, develop this, like for lack of a better word, character who felt very wolfy in nature. And I realized, oh, I am really looking to a lot of the, like the Jewish masculinity in my family, which feels very wolfy. Um, very hairy right? I mean literally like just you know wolfy um, so it started with that but then it quickly like the association sort of came in around um, the closet wolves shape-shifting sort of like by day by night um, sort of the way also there's something that I, I think makes sense in terms of my uncle's life like he's this incredible doctor who takes care of our entire extended family he's the only doctor in the family and so nobody even questions his other life, like, you know, um, but then by night, you know, he's also gay. Um, but then there's just like the shape shifting that we all sort of have as gay people and twilight people. And um, then, you know, also wolves and the moon and Jewish time is based on the moon. And so like wolves are sort of governed by the moon. So is, so is time um the I mean it just kind of it just kind of went from there there's lots of wolf stories folk tales around people um turning into wolves and you know there's like a, around trauma and like uh like sort of I've heard a lot of stories uh, like around like survivors turning into wolves and like killing their families just like from that internalized like trauma of like and then it being taken out on each other you know just a lot of that sort of thing um but yeah I would say that it it came it came from there but then there's like the idea of the wolf as in we, we all have this wolf mess inside I mean we all have the potential of of being harmed and harming, like being both predator and prey. And um, just thinking about the wolf as also a, an embodiment of like, um, I don't even know what the word is, like things about ourselves, messy things about ourselves as humans that we would like to get rid of, but actually have to just contend yeah. with every day. Yeah. I mean, Giorgio Agamben, the philosopher wrote that um, essentially, I'm going to paraphrase it, but basically the line between human and animal actually doesn't actually run between the human and animal. It runs directly through the human. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Love that. Um, so regarding generational trauma, right? It is something that, that can be so deeply specific to an individual. And at the same time, uh, you know, can speak to an entire community, especially when it's tied to religion. So how do you navigate in the performance between, you know, your very specific experience, right? And then the larger, uh, particularly in relation to anti-Zionism, of course. Yeah. Well, in this piece, particularly, I'm thinking about how uh, both as queers and as Jews, we like metab, I mean, but specifically to your question, like, um, how Jews, how we can metabolize trauma so that we, that we don't recreate, like we, we don't become the oppressors and cre recreate the harm. And I think this is something that, um, you know, <laughs> we're seeing play out today in such a devastating, horrific way. Um, but 
to me, um, this led me to, I, well, first of all, just to say like the queer lineage, thinking about these queer, these lineages, they're also lineages of different forms of care and resilience. And um, so in terms of anti-Zionism, like how, how, how else we look for safety through solidarity and through like that we don't need. In fact, it's, it's, it's not safe for us to align with power to an empire and state um, because we lose, we lose connection with ourselves and each other. Um, and we don't need nation states for that. We need um, solidarity. So, and to live in peace it, as good guests in diaspora, wherever we are. Um, but I, I'm sort of talking about this stuff through the story of Purim. It's Purim season. Purim this year is actually at the end of March. And Purim is kind of an incredible holiday. It's very like, it's one of the most secular of the holidays. Um, it's um, like Svetlana said in her introduction, that writing, it's a holiday that basically the actual holiday is reading the book of Esther from beginning to end at synagogue. Um, and um, I can say more about the book of Esther, but then there's this tradition, this like Yiddish tradition of the Purim spiel, which is called a Purim play, which is where everyone in the congregation dresses up as the characters in the story and acts it out. And it's very like funny pageantry it's like a comic dramatization of the story um and it's a it's a performance tradition that actually predates Yiddish theater um like it kind of birthed one of the things that birthed Yiddish theater and it's kind of a it's it's not exactly a religious tradition but it's involved with the religious practice and so to me that's very interesting like what is a ritual what is a performance what is a religious practice what is like a spiritual you know like all these things and the blur blurring of lines. Um, so just on a, just in, just in terms of the form, I thought that was very interesting. But then in terms of the actual content of the piece, I mean, the story of Esther tells the story about how Esther, with the help of another very important uncle, biblical uncle Mordecai, saves the Jews from destruction in Persia um, at a certain moment in time. And most, and, and then the second half of the story, like they go on, the Jews then go on to enact genocide on everyone who just tried to enact it on them. Um, and most times the Purim story just ends with the Jews being saved. It's like, and then they were saved, you know, and they don't tell the rest of the story in the Purim spiel or the rest of the story is, is um, chalked up to like self-defense, you know, um, when in fact, it's really a whole second, it's a, like a 50% second half of the story detailing the genocide and massacre of all these things. So it's really a revenge fantasy. And it's, um, and I think it's very important to reclaim the whole story uh, because it's like reclaiming the whole story of ourselves that we are not just perpetual victims, that we're all the characters in the story. Um, and so I think that that has repercussions right now in terms of what's going on in Palestine, um, what's going on in the broader Jewish community around it, like this idea that we are, yeah, perpetual victims here and that like just not being able to see the tremendous horror um, being enacted by the state of Israel in our name. Um, in fact, the prime minister is even talking about, I think it was the prime minister, but like the Israeli government is is invoking the name of Amalek, which is this other biblical sort of evil, evil character that 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 Haman, the villain of Purim, is actually supposed to be a descendant of. Um, that there's an Amalek in every generation, and that we have to wipe out, that we have to like get rid of to be safe as Jews. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I think, I mean, obviously this is a, per, a performance. This is not like a direct action right now, like in the streets around this, but it's hopefully, um, you know, something that can contribute to like, uh, an anti-Zionist sort of reclamation and a narrative shift of like, you know, 
being full, messy humans, just like everyone else, but really claiming that so we don't enact, so, so we can reckon with it and, and, and move forward without like enacting that harm. Yes, absolutely. And um, for anyone who hasn't read my uh, essay in this month's Broken Rail, it is all about the queer solidarity with Palestine. And I encourage you to read it. And yes, I think, and, and I know that you're also very active on the streets um, and you do a lot of direct action, but indeed, I think it's it's also important to think of ways that uh, we can we can address this in 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 the work that we're already doing, right? So th that's been an that's been a major thing for me. I'm like, how how can I incorporate this into something that I'm already planning to write, right? How how can I um, address this in the classroom? Um, and even if it's just like assigning Edward Said, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so what was it like working with the kitchen, which is yeah. in a temporary space that I just love the space. I kind of wish they would stay there. Yeah. Um, uh, even though you had, I guess you, you didn't have, you didn't have the view. I actually would love to hear about that decision to uh, close the windows. Yeah. Well, um, I guess first off the site of the kitchen right now, the kitchen is on like the actual kitchen's building is under renovations so they are temporarily at West Beth artist housing which is an incredible complex like just in and of itself like with such an amazing history and so many amazing artists who like live there it just feels like this old New York I mean you know New York is very 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 old as we know but like this moment in time that's been, I think it's been there for over 40 years some of the people in that in that um and so it's a beautiful loft space that overlooks the Hudson River the Mahikana talk and um it's yeah it's just stunning I think that the scenic design or like the site itself feels meaningful in a lot of ways and the scenic designer was hoping to just sort of um imagine this like not like try like use the site as the site there's a way in which the columns in the site look like trees and forests that looks and also the way that she, Kate McRae is the scenic designer that she um utilized the space also makes it seem like the town square or like a temporary Yiddish theater pop-up <laughs> vibe or like um which is has meaning in the piece um it's in the round um and yeah, I mean, the decision to 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 close the windows is really that that uh, I think just to keep it more intimate. And I mean, I, I'm not sure this was a decision that the whole creative team had, which made sense when you're in there in terms of like, um, we are here in the site, but we are also in many different times and places. And I think that seeing like the big W on the in New Jersey would have been a little bit like pulled out of that. Um, <laughs> Like the time, 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 totally time period. But um, but it is a beautiful view, and then the kitchen itself. And so also um, across the courtyard in the complex was for forty years the home of CBST Congregation Beit Simcha Torah, which is a like LGBTQIA synagogue, one of the first that my uncle was actually an early member of. Like he joined during the initial decade of HIV AIDS because of needing a place to like mourn and have clergy services like many people did at that time. And um, so it had me like, we, I didn't know that when we decided on the project, like that's one of the beautiful like serendipitous like things that happened that I was like, oh my God, this is where this, this was for 40 years, you know? And so has that meaning um, and my uncle was the first person who brought me to high holiday services as an adult. Um, and he's definitely one of the ones who is, a. would say he's one of the most religious people in my family. Um, so that's just interesting. And then there's the kitchen, which I have a long history with and is so meaningful to be invited back as an artist. I worked there from 1999 to 2006. When I was a wee little person, I got hired like when I, I turned 21 at the kitchen, which is like, oh, I remember my 21st birthday there. And um, I went from being like an intern to then becoming like the director of operations. I saw, I think maybe three different directors there. Like it was 
you know, and I, I feel like I went to graduate school at the kitchen. I met, my mind was like blown by the artists that I got to work with. Cause I grew up as like a child actor in tradition, more traditional theater, you know, and then got to be like in the dressing room with like Yoko Ono and like, you know, I was just like, wow. or like Charlie Schneeman or, you know, and, and at the time like Sapphire and all these people, you know, um, Robbie McCauley and so many brilliant people. And then I got to also sort of be in some of the people's work like Julie Tolentino, um, who's definitely a performance uncle for me and uh, Susanna Cook. And there were a bunch of, yeah, a bunch of people. And so I just had like a graduate school, both in like uh, arts administration, but also in like performance studies, as you would say now. Like it's, uh, and uh and I literally did everything from like sweep the floors to send out the emails to doing the marketing to dealing with like the elevator and the, the like I it was like overseeing all the programming and so it's so meaningful to me to then be invited back as an artist and and uh, yeah it just feels like a full circle. That's moment. incredible. I want to hear more about your theater background because I know that you also worked with Brooke O'Hara and uh -huh. you were part of Room for Cream. Yes. <laughs> legendary yeah. lesbian series Will yes, you yes. That? well I grew up as a child I mean I grew up I grew up in Williamstown Massachusetts my family is from New York um I was in all the plays and I was often the ch like I was in all this like school plays or community theater plays and I was often the child actor you know like if a child was needed in a professional theater or whatever it would you know like I was called um Apparently agents came and scouted me for like a, some revival of Annie that was happening at that time. But my, I, for whatever reason, I didn't go to, I would have to have moved to New York and that wasn't in the cards. Um, and I'm, I'm glad because I would probably be dead if I was like an actual child actor, like for real, <laughs> not have made it. But um, yeah, I went to, um, I ended up not joining a theater company after high school and I went to college. I went to Sarah Lawrence College and my that's partly where my ideas about theater really grew. And like, anyway, I got the job at the kitchen sort of through connections from Sarah Lawrence. Elise Bernhardt had been a, who was the director at the time, went to Sarah Lawrence. So yeah, but I grew up, it was, you know, like, uh, Shakespeare and musicals and stuff like that. So it was very, um, very quite different. Um, and, you know, I, at, in college, I also sort of left that because I came out and also had to reckon with a lot of like emotional baggage around, around being like what, what act, what performance was for me as a, like, a, you know, in my family and kind of being the entertainer um I'm not yeah. gonna that but yeah like just like that was a survival I that was a survival technique for me and I didn't I didn't that's not sustainable as a survival technique it needed to be something else so yeah. I just did a performance um thinking through my uh childhood desire to be a clown it's the first thing that I wanted to be as a child was a clown and so I got really into like clown theory and I talked to a professional clown and uh there was something really profound that she said uh, where she was like, you know, a lot of people think that uh, the clown's job in the circus is if an acrobat falls to distract from the acrobat's fall. But oh. actually that really goes against the clown's identity. The clown's job is to deal with the fall. And so mm -hmm. I was talking through like, you know, me as a child having to deal with all these people in my life falling. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love that you're saying that because I was just saying to somebody the other night, like, you know, growing up, I always identified as a clown, as a gender, like as an, a gender option that was not any one of, it wasn't, you know, somewhere in between, like it was a fluid, a more fluid option, it kind of took me out of the having to deal with that. Um, and certainly identified about it, like in terms of entertaining and like being my way of navigating through school and through performance in my family um 
I think as an adult, I feel even now I'm reclaiming, there's many, what's exciting is that there's this like community, I think of, of like anti-Zionist performance clowns in the city, you know, and that I feel very much in community with. Um, and I think I'm re like the re reclamation of the clown as like, you know, a tr more traditional like fool, like truth telling fool, um, thinking about mourning trauma, like how, for me anyway, I feel like comedy and the clown is one of the medicines that we have to work with that we can, that for me anyway, I'm like, want to bring people along with me. Like it's about access and it's about like, you know, bringing people with me through hard stuff, you know, like it's clown is not like, you know, I don't know. It's, it, I think that there's also a Jewish tradition around, like, I think actually Svetlana said it, like toggling like the like fine line between like grief and humor. I think that it's, and it's not just in the tra Jewish tradition. It's not just in the Jewish tradition, you know, it's like that thing of like, but per, for me, it's one of the tools I have to yeah. tell a story. I was gonna ask you also uh, whether because something else that I took away from the performance is, you know, you were speaking to um, how childhood or teenage trauma fears mm -hmm. can interfere with the adult ability to connect in certain ways. Um, and so ha is this in a way also a sort of exorcism for you? Oh my God, totally. I mean, it's funny, I don't know what other artists do, but I feel like I make work for many reasons, but for me, it's to like go right to the thing that feels like that needs the most like tending to spiritually or emotionally. And I try and go right to that to sort of like sort through it for myself. Um, hopefully it doesn't come out that way. Like hopefully it doesn't come out as like a navel gazing like therapy session, but to me, there is something very profound about like, like tending to that wounded spot through the performance and hoping also that perhaps other people share in a wounding that's similar and like that we can all be there together. There's something about having a witness witnessing um, that helps that. So I would say also of all the performances that I had, like the three in this trilogy, this one is really intense. I mean, I hate the word ritual. I mean, I don't hate it. I think there's actual rituals that are important, but like when people use ritual and perform like that thing, I don't, I'm not trying to be precious about ritual, but there is this line between, I also sometimes don't like performance. So whatever. I think that there's like that line between what is a performance? What is a ritual? And I'm, I'm using some actual like Jewish protection magic mm -hmm. in this, that I was share, like that Dory Midnight, a friend and Jewish priestess mm -hmm. shared with me and, and others have shared with me like certain aspects of the show that really set up, you know, that I'm using actual like materials, ritual materials. Um, and that, and it feels, so it's intending to actually be like bringing out, you know, this wolf um, mm -hmm. in a protected space and intentionally, so. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say also last night, I don't know if you saw, but I feel like somebody had brought a dog in and I oh, hadn't. My friend Andrea, she was Oh my there. God. Oh, it's Andrea and Dyer's dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was growling oh. at some point, but he was so well behaved. No, oh, but that was so wild because he growled when I finally turned into the wolf. I mean, no, spoil no spoiler alerts, but when I turned into the wolf, that's when he growled. Like he didn't growl the entire other time. And I was like, wow, that dog just gave me confirmation that I am indeed a wolf now, you know? Yeah, no, he was dead asleep the whole time. And even when everybody was stomping because there's uh, a lot of audience engagement at times and people were stomping and howling and the dog was totally fine. And then when you're the wolf and at some point Sasha is crawling over the floor and Phoenix started growling. <laughs> I was like, no, I was like, okay. I, I that There's like some, I'm like, he get on some level he just was like blessed me he was like yes you I, I recognize you I felt recognized and seen and then many people thought that it was you growling 
Um, yeah. I'm curious actually to hear your thoughts about, um, cause you mentioned sometimes not liking the term performance. And I, um, you know, I think that within at least the New York art world, there is so little room for theater. It's like so easily something becomes performance that just like the the trendier term to use. It's how you, it, it, you have more chances of getting a grant. And like, there are so few spaces left that actually do theater, you know, like Dixon Place, La Mama, and these places don't have any money. Uh, there's so little money for theater. Um, you know, what, what, what has happened to theater um, and, and how, your your performance is isn't your performance is an example of in a way bringing theater back into performance if that makes sense so is that something that you're consciously uh, thinking about committed to um tell me about that yeah no it's a great it's a great question i um i think because of how i grew up in the theater i'm i have such a soft spot for theater and like it's in my it's just feels like it's in my muscle memory um and so I feel like my, you know, but then all the other influences around just sort of like other kinds of performance and durational work and all these people who have maybe some of them I listed like helped sort of expand that. So I do definitely feel like I'm working in an intersection of like theater and performance art, which whatever that means, you know? Um, and it's interesting to the pipe. Well, first of all, I mean, the economies of that in the city or just like the way the structures are, are totally different. Like my collaborators on these, on this piece, everybody, my last piece, it was a mix of like just other queer artists like me who were outside eyes and, you know, blending different stylings and da, da, da. this piece, all the collaborators are theater makers, um, all the designers. And it was my first, like, I just want to name like, those yeah. folks, Namuna Cisse was the director. She was, um, she's incredible. She also helped, she's been with the project for seven seven months and really helped drama, like, like shape it, shape the story. Um, she's brilliant. She was the assistant director on Strange Loop. Um, and then from there, we assembled this amazing team of designers, which maybe I'll just, maybe we can like put that in the chat so that everyone can yeah. Yeah, so. let's put it in the chat, and and I would love for you to talk more about those collaborations. The yeah, so I learned so much in this because theater is such a structured, it has such a structure to it, um, the creation of a work, like just down to, to like, I, I'm so used to doing everything myself, like coming from the per performance world's in the city, you know, like we just make, do it all ourselves, but to have a director involved, to have these designers involved with like, literally where like, you know, I'm learning like, oh, a stage manager needed to be in rehearsals because even though it's just me, I, I don't even know how to explain this. It just well, have, having designers who are all used to working in a lot of structured theater, I think um, helped me learn like, oh, this is what, like if I were a playwright in a very traditional sense, you know, the play would be given, I would step away. <laughs> there would be a, an amazing actor hired to do the show. And then there would be these like systems and structures of how the show would be mounted. And in the performance world that I'm from, it's kind of like, just doesn't have that structure. It's kind of like I a feeling. I would also add that it's not just the performance world, it's also being queer, I think. It's like, yeah. we so often just have to do things ourselves. Yeah. Like DIY is an essential, um, you know. But this team of people, Namuna and I assembled this team of people from people that she knew and people that I knew. And they're, they're incredible. I would say most of them are Jewish and from all different backgrounds. Um, oh, there we go in the chat now so just to say their names for the for the archive um mm -hmm. and the associate director is sammy estrella um lou coy is live as a musician and they composed a couple of songs they're an incredible musician and vocalist um azalea fairley is the costume designer alejandro fajardo is the lighting designer the lighting designer yuka Huatuko is the movement designer. 
Kate McRae is a scenic designer, Isaac Silber is the sound designer, Ariana Sway is the production manager, and then of course Allison Burstein from the Kitchen is the curator. And was yes, and how was that? How was it working with Allison, who I am a big fan of? Um, I adore Allison. I think she is um, so full of, she moves in such graceful care, caring full ways like she really is like I really feel like she stewarded the project um in such thoughtful ways all every every like part of the way um with this and yeah it was a I would say my primary partner in our <laughs> I don't even know what but in our poly <laughs> whatever um yeah my primary partner in, in 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 and and like believing in the vision for this when it was just really a kernel of an idea so yeah, and think, you will be in conversation at some point, right? I think that we are in conversation for some sort of private event, um, but we could be in conversation in a public event if anyone wants to uh, do that. But but yeah, but back to your thing, there are not a lot of spaces in New York that where theater and performance kind of like the, the kind of work that I and, and many others here may really thrives. Like there's just very few spaces. Um, and the kitchen, so not only, I think for me, it was the first time that I got to work with all of these designers in an early way in my work. And I think it really expanded the kind of storytelling that I could do with a solo body. And also the kitchen's um, support in such a deep way, like is also not something I've experienced before. And I think it's something that the kitchen itself is like new to experimenting with uh, this sort of hybrid producing presenting mode um so yeah 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 um you mentioned your body and that is something else that i wanted to ask you about like what is because you're moving through all your shape shifting right and uh at some points you're sweating you're yelling you're how what is your awareness of your body like throughout the performance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, like I would say my awareness of my body before and after the performance is very apparent. <laughs> um, just like how I feel, what it does to it. But during it, um, it's interesting. The with dad band, I am I embodied my dad or a dad the whole time. So it was like one thing. With the second piece, Sherry Dre, I am embodied my grandmother and her alter ego or other self state that was a showgirl. And I shape shifted between the two of them. Um, and, but the core was really my grandmother. I would always return to my grandmother. And like my father and my grandmother are people who I had a very clear knowing about in my body and how to, you know, move with them. In this piece, I'm moving through for the first time, several people, like I'm myself, which is also super weird. I'm trying to be myself in dialogue with these people in the piece. Um, Cause it's not, it's myself, but it's not my totally myself. And then there's the uncle figure in the piece, Mordecai, who feels very like the most embodied of them because that's sort of the figure that I had started with. And then I also move into this figure of Peppy Lippman, who is a Brodo Zinger ancestor. Um, and I think that, I don't even know how to answer the question. It's like when I'm in the performance, I'm, the choreography of them is already there. And so I'm just connecting to them and to the audience. And I'm not super aware of what's happening in my body. Shape-shifting, I just kind of, uh, I know that sounds like a silly answer. Like, I don't know, it just happens, man. I don't mean it like that. I just mean it like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to connect to some sort of essence and some sort of, well, I guess I should also say that Yuka as the movement director gave me some helpful direction to like postures and certain things that kind of set me, set me off on a track. And um, also because I'm writing the piece, like I'm, what I'm saying and what I'm doing is sort of helping me experience them mm -hmm. in my body. 
But yeah, shape shifting. Well, I mean, partly why I make solo performance right now or have made these solo performances is that I feel that the fact that it's all happening within my own body allows for a kind of like psycho, like psychosocial storytelling because it's all happening sort of within me. And there's this meta thing that it's like within me, these are happening. Um, so it's intention, it's intentional. And I think we all shape shift and code switch all the time as queers, so. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Um, Sasha, thank you so much. Is there yeah. anything else that you feel we didn't get to that you would like to throw out there before we move into questions? Wow, I don't think so. I think I'd love to hear if there's any questions. Yeah. I think we have some. Thanks, Ksenia and Sasha. That was such a pleasure to listen to. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions. And if anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free to post them in the chat or raise your hand. GE, I'll pass you the mic first. Thank you very much, Chloe. Hi, Hi everybody. Thank you, Sasha. And and um, I'm so so happy. I always love it when we do when 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 th when theater enters the NSE. Um, Natasha, do you do you see yourself as uh, as a botchin or botkin? You know, from the old Oscanazic uh, professional entertainer, the poets, sometimes also you know holy clowns that actually were at weddings a lot of times that then evolved into the whole Borschfeld comedian thing that you know came out of that tradition. Uh, and, and, and sort of guiding us through the sort of ceremony, giving us these commentaries and truth? Hmm, what a great question. Oh. I would love to know more about them. I, I, I'm not sure I know that tradition and I'd like to. Um, part of this project is also like reconnecting to these traditions that I feel like I have, um, for whatever reason, maybe Zionism, I don't know, like been a little bit allergic to of like really looking at biblical traditions and cultural traditions and, and, uh, um, but I, yeah, I, so I've learned, I also just like in terms of that question about like, uh, exorcism that I was asked, but similarly, I do these projects to learn and research. Um, so I'd love to hear about that. What I can say is that, um, the, like, one of the traditions like Jewish cultural traditions, performance traditions that I definitely utilize in the performance is like Borscht Belt stand-up kind of comedy. And I certainly, vaudeville, Borscht Belt comedy, um, the Purim Spiel, drag, Yiddish theater, you know, queer nightlife. These are all things that are sort of referenced. And so, yeah, I'm gonna look that up when we finish that in the werewolf game. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I, the, the spelling of the whole thing is in the chat. So. Great. Thank you, GE. Thanks for that answer, Sasha. I also thought it, I when I know the werewolf game, Ksenia. So that was, I, I thought it was a thing in yeah. the country. Also, I'm all you know. I was born in Russia. I grew up in the Netherlands, and now I'm here. And I, so I'm always in between countries. I'm like, where? What is a thing? Where? Um, yeah, it's definitely a thing. Um, <laughs> I mean, one of the, also one of the things I was like another, cause you mentioned sort of like leading people through the ceremony or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the cantor is also like another, you know, that's the sort of like role that is, can be like that, like leading people through services, through connecting through song, through it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Emmy played for uh a while. Eleanor has a question for you, Sasha. Eleanor, I'll pass you the mic. Thanks, Chloe. Um, thank you so much, Sasha and Ksenia. This is amazing. Um, I, I would like to ask, is it okay if I ask two questions? Okay. Um, my first question, Sasha, is um, about your uh, kind of, well, something I was thinking about as we were looking at the slideshow today was like this word that I think Sarah Silverman said first called that where she said a Jew face. And I was thinking about kind of the way that um, 
like caricatures of mostly Ashkenazi Jews are like kind of to relate back to your point about a uh, victimhood in uh you know Jewish discourse is you know kind of has been used by Sarah Silverman for example um to kind of create an another um sort of victim like complex in a way in media with um who plays Jewish characters and what uh you know physical um markers are used to notate that um and I think that it's you know using a term like Jew face kind of whatever um I, I won't get too much into my opinion on her take but I'm but the, what I've been really thinking about is that there's been a lot of history like in Yiddish theater and Tin Can Alley and lots of um performance history in the Jewish community where like Jewish people represent themselves in like a satirical way um, and kind of play into and explore maybe stereotypes that um, are sometimes used against them and kind of like use them in their own work. And I saw a little bit of you doing that. Um, and I'm just curious about your thoughts on the history or connections to the history of Yiddish performance um, in that regard and like um yeah I guess anything related to that sorry that I can yeah <laughs> well first off I just think it's a bit problematic to say Jew face like it's yeah. obviously pulling on the tradition of blackface which is a exactly. whole other, that's a whole other thing yeah. there's that a is. great Jewish Currents article about Sarah Silverman's take that I'll just drop in the chat if anyone's interested but yeah like the history of minstrel shows and blackface and like you know structural racism, power racism in this country is like a whole different. So I feel it's very problematic to, to use yeah. that term. Um, I, <laughs> what do I have to say? I guess I have to say that like, I, in my work, I am looking at some stereotypes, like the idea of like Jews I mean, and this, are, this is not specific just to Jews, but I'm speaking just like as a Jew and like some of the history of these stereotypes, like, you know, animal, like animalistic, like, you know, that compared to rats or wool, like anything that's like an animal. Um, and same thing with like anybody, like gays, anybody who's considered a monster, like monsters are definitely the, a, the, a broader theme in this show. I mean, the werewolf is part of a larger monster the golem there's there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of like references to monsters in the show um and monstrosity and what is considered monstrosity and um so I think yes and of course there's some parts of M Mordecai and all these things that can sort of walk a fine line between like what is a stereo what is re re uh reclaiming a stereotype into something else um but I think the broader question of like, I don't know, whatever, Mrs. Maisel or any any kind of like Jewish representation. And for some reason, there's a lot more happening right now. Um, I guess I don't, I guess I don't feel, I mean, I feel like if when there's fucked up shit, like, sorry for my language, but like, if, you know, someone's wearing like a prosthetic nose or something or like, you know, obvious like um, things, I think that I find that, I find that problematic. Um, I don't know I feel like yeah it'd be great if a Jewish person can play a Jewish person um I don't feel I guess I don't know what to say about this I feel like sure yeah I do feel I do feel kind of like a Jew should play a Jew especially in these like um stories that are being told, but I also am more concerned, honestly, about the stories being told and how the Jews are portrayed in the stories and what the content and what we're telling, the stories we're telling ourselves as Jewish people and like as non-Jewish people about Jews, then yeah, I would say that's, I think my main concern. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I totally. think that even within myself in the shows, like I don't want to offend the ancestors. I don't want to offend, I'm trying, you know, um, trying to make things really, the reclamation of stereotypes very specific. So they're not just generalizations that are again, causing more harm or perpetuating more stereotypes, you know? 
no so yeah, hopefully totally yeah no that makes sense I think it's it's all it's really interesting because like a lot of the um stereotypes like in Jewish theater communities a lot of them well I don't know I guess it's hard to trace their origination but that was like such a huge part of Yiddish theater like those playing with those stereotypes and it was like you know that's I think that that is yeah can be explored in theater now so it's cool to see that because it's like it was and yeah and very and it was very much like kind of an audience thing which kind of goes to my next question um where like it's kind of like inside jokes and things like that it's it's fun it's fun to explore that but um my other question is about the um your audience and like who you think of or who you've thought of as your audience for this show and I'm thinking especially about the anti-Zionist work and communities that you do um, that you're a part of and like ha- did you receive any pushback from people do you like I'm I'm, assu- I'm ex- assuming that there was a lot of gratitude in the audience for that as well I know like personally I'm always really uh drawn and excited t- to hear any like loud outspoken anti-Zionist Jewish voices but I'm just wondering about audience in that context. Yeah, well, first I should say it was just first opening night last night. So we'll see that the night was like full <laughs> of people I knew. Um, so uh, a lot of like, you know, people who had been on the streets with me and in my communities for a long time. So, but it's a great question. I think first off, I feel like my, the work, I, you know, very much the work is is meant for other Jews of all, hopefully anyone, I mean, one being part of like uh, someone who's as an anti-Zionist Jew contributing to like larger conversations that we're all having and just like doing my part in that. Like you were like, um, Ksenia was saying like wherever we can speaking up. Um, So it's certainly for my fellow anti-Zionist Jewish people, it's hopefully there's a broader spectrum of Jewish folks that are going to connect to it. I know for a fact, I'm not going to name names, but I know for a fact there was a couple of them there last night who had some thoughts for me after the show. Um, People who probably know a lot more about Jewish traditions like Purim and things I'm referencing and maybe in a a different, not not an anti-Zionist view of them. Um, And then, you know, to me, it's very critical that this piece is not just for Jewish people, like that anyone could find a connection into it um and the themes of it and hopefully it's for for all those things um but it's very into it is interactive and it's very intimate so I don't know we'll see how it like we'll see how it goes I have had I have had a bunch of interesting convers let's just say a bunch of interesting conversations along the way here you know I mean I started making this piece long before October 7th and obviously, like the occupation in Palestine is not new. And so, um, but this particular like escalated horrific moment of genocide there is like, um, for a while there, for a couple months was putting the show under much more scrutiny than I was thinking I would be scrutinized by members of my own family, <laughs> primarily, like other Zionist members of my family. Um, and I think now it's just because of the moment we're in, I think it might draw other, but who knows? I mean, hopefully I'm just one of many people like contributing to, um, you know, if you have a platform right now of any kind, like that's what we do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sasha. Mm-hmm. Thanks for those questions. Those are, yeah. Thank you. Questions, Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasha, for answering our questions. Thank you, Ksenia, for your amazing hosting today. And thank you, of course, one more time for Sasha for all your insights into this project. I can't wait to see the performance. And I encourage 
everyone to see the performance. There are tickets that became available for tonight's performance. Um, and you can, uh, we posted a link in the chat to register for tickets. I'd also really like to thank Allison at the kitchen as well as Blake um, for their support in preparing for today. And of course, to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art who sponsor this program, the new social environment and make weekday conversations like this one possible. The rail has been free and independent for 23 years. You can donate to our work via the link in the chat to support our staff and our operations. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with captives uh, on Captives of Heartbreak, a critics page conversation featuring Elliot Jerome Brown Jr., Jill H. Cassid, Sean Fader, Wendy Lauderman, Mev Luna, Cassie Packard, Rachel Stern, Leandra Lasser, and someone we all may know, Ksenia M. Sobaliva. Um, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. And thank you one more time to Sasha. <laughs> thank you, Chloe. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank Sasha. You. Thank that you so much, so Sasha. Cool. Thank, you thank, you so much. Much. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Tonight. Thanks, Ksenia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ksenia. Get your tickets, everyone. Link Congratulations on the show, Sasha. <laughs> thank you. Fun. Thank yes. You. Let's go see the show, you guys. Please spread out the love. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs>